piece. So went ahead and just clicked the recording button. So welcome. Um, this is our fall 2021 CAV presentation for Biomedical Acoustics Group. Uh, fortunate to have Dr. Mehdi Kiani from the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Penn State agreed to give a talk. He's our newest faculty member to the Biomedical Acoustics Group. Um, and he does a lot of circuits, so very excited to learn about advanced biomedical interfaces with innovative integrated circuits and systems. So just a little bit about Dr. Kiani. He received his MS and PhD degrees in electrical and computer engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, he joined Penn State in 2014 and is now an associate professor. He's got a lot of research interests, um, as he said as we were chatting beforehand he's really interested in the circuits and now he's working on applying it to ultrasound for neuromodulation and other uh, transplantable technologies. He's a career award winner and an associate editor of IEEE transactions on biomedical circuits and systems. So without further ado Dr. Kiani I'll let you take it away and thanks for presenting. And thanks really for the introduction. Do you see my slides? We do see your slides. Okay so thanks for the intro introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello everyone. So today I'm gonna to, uh, present some of the work that we do in my lab at Penn State. And um, these are related to uh, biomedical applications. That's what my lab do, does. And uh, in, in, in this um, talk, I'm gonna pick two of those applications, which are kind of a combination of ultrasound and circuits and systems, and show you how we use ultrasound in our systems to develop innovative you know, um, medical applications. Um, and these are the work done by a couple of PhD students that have been graduated and some of them who are still uh, doing their work here. So before I get into the project, I wanted to show you an overview of what we do at Penn State in my lab, and then uh, we focus on two of them. So we are interested in two organs in general. One of them is the brain. And uh, what we want to do in general is to develop implantable devices that they can interface with the brain for high resolution and large scale neural interfacing. So we want to be able to read from the brain and also write to the brain. And uh, we have been developing technologies with different modalities. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about ultrasound stimulation that can be used to stimulate the, uh, the neural activity in the brain. Another organ that we are interested in is the stomach. And in this one, we are developing implantable devices so that they can interface with the stomach to have high resolution and large scale um, gastric slow wave mapping, mapping. And I will also talk about this project. We also do a lot of work in energy harvesting, ultrasound and magnetoelectric wireless power transfer and communication. I'm not gonna get into most of this a little bit on ultrasound power transfer, because that's related to the project we do on the stomach. And also we do work related to the assistive technologies and neural mass models. So I'm gonna focus mostly on these two applications, the brain and stomach in this um, talk. We do a lot of circuits. Uh, here you can see an example of the chips um, that we have developed over the years for different applications, power management, neural interface, ultrasound stimulation. Some of them you will see in this talk, but uh, if you're interested, you can go and read our papers in this area. So here in this talk, I'm gonna first discuss this high resolution gastric electric, electrical wave mapping technology that we are working on. Then I'm gonna focus on ultrasound neuromodulation and at the end conclusion. So as I mentioned, the work that I'm gonna show you here is mostly related to ultrasound, which is the topic more interested by this group. Um, so first, why, why do we do this electrical wave mapping of stomach? And gastric dysrhythmia is the main source of several gastric disorders. For example, gastroparesis. And the patients with these disorders, usually they um, experience difficulty in emptying their stomach. They have pain, nausea. And it's very well known that gastric contractions or in general motility, they are initiated and also coordinated by an electrical activity that we call them slow wave activity. And it's very important to map gastric slow wave activities in high resolution and real time so that we can diagnose and then treat gastric disorders. We have been collaborating with a group at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And this is the system that they were using so far. So they have this electrode array, they open the skin, they put this electrode array on the stomach serosa or the stomach surface, and they do the high resolution electrical wave mapping. But as you can see here, this cannot be used for long-term recording on awake patients. 
That's why in collaboration with the New York Institute of Technology and Feinstein Institute, over the past few years, we have been developing these implantable medical devices for uh, gastric mapping. This is an example of the first device that we work on. So we had a board with electronics on it, and then we had these electro uh, electrodes, which are like the contacts. These are wrapped around the board and then through endoscopy probe. This is implanted into the submucosal layer of the stomach, and I will show you a video that shows how we implant this. But the idea is to have this implantable device into the submucosal layer of the stomach. It sits over there. Then we have a variable unit that transfers power to this implantable device through, all, through inductive in this case, and also communicates back through backscattering to this variable unit. And the variable unit sends this data to a stationary unit for further processing. Uh, this is a video here showing Yeah, showing how my collaborator um, does the implantation, basically with an endoscopy, endoscopical probe, he goes into the, the stomach, then he creates like a pocket into the stomach. He does a tunneling, creates a pocket into the layer, into the submucosal layer of the stomach. And then we put the device in inside this pocket and then he sutured it, closes the, the the pocket so that the device stays there for some time. So as you are watching this video, so this was our first try for this system, but we realized that there are several challenges here. The first thing is that, as you saw the device in the previous slide, the device is big, it's bulky, and the stomach has a lot of movement. So due to this bulkiness of the device and the stomach motility, there are a couple of challenges here. The first one is that this device can move into this um, inside this pocket and then with the movement, we get motion artifacts. So the recording quality would be poor. The second problem is that the device is large and it can damage the enteric nervous system under the submucosal layer. And the third one is that still the device is very centralized and we have limited recording channel. That's why we have decided to move from this to an, into a new paradigm. And that's what I'm gonna show you in the previous uh, in the next slides but here you can see the implantation of the device and then we rem and then the xvivo uh, showing how this device the electrodes have been spread so that's why i'm going to show you a new system that i call it gastric seed in order to reduce the size of these devices so what we are proposing here is to instead of having a centralized device we have many more devices, each of them very small. I envision them to be in the size of a grain of rice, that's small like 10 millimeter cube. Then we implant them into the submucosal layer wherever we want, and they can record this gastric slow wave activity and transfer the data out. So the main challenge here is that these devices are very small. How do you power them or communicate with them? And that's why we have chosen ultrasound here because ultrasound is a better technique when you have larger depth and smaller device. So we use ultrasound for both powering and communication. And I will show you some of the slides of how we, we do this ultrasound power and data transfer. So this is a theory of how ultrasound power transfer works. In general, if you have a transducer, this could be an array or a single transducer with a natural focus. So you have a focal zone here. And at this focal zone, you get the maximum intensity of this ultrasound. Now the efficiency for power transfer is the intensity here multiplied by the area of the receiver transducer that you put and the electric and the mechanical to electrical efficiency of the transducer divided by the input power. So if my receiver is small, I ideally want to put this at the focal zone because here I get the largest intensity. If it's larger, you can also put it in a different location. So in this transducer, the, it's very important to operate them at their resonance frequency to get high efficiency. And also this focal length, the distance from the transducer to this focal zone is dependent on the diameter of this transducer, the frequency and the velocity of ultrasound in the medium. So as you can see, things are complex here. It needs some type of optimization in order to find out the best geometry for the transmitter and the receiver. And that's what we did. The first thing we did with my first group of PhD students, we developed this console model that we could uh, simulate this um, 
this this link in console. So this is the transmitter. This is like sitting on the skin. Castor oil, we use it to mimic the tissue because it has par parameters very close to tissue. This is the receiver transducer, and this is the distance for powering. So this has a backing of air in order to have better efficiency here. For this one, the receiver transducer, we have a backing layer of silicon that mimics the electronics we need on the implant side. And the things to optimize are the diameter thickness of the transmitter and receiver considering the distance and the loading. And again, we did this optimization and we built a system. I don't go through the optimization here, but we built this wireless link, as you can see here in the experimental setup. This is the transmitter transducer, which is a larger one. And then this is the small transducer that we made. So the diameter of this one is one millimeter. This is one millimeter cube, that small transducer. We, we glued this to the board and then use a wire bond to make the other connection. So we fabricated this in house at Penn State. We did the measurement for this one. Here is the impedance measurement of the transmitter, the larger transducer. So we realized that if we operate close to anti-resonance here, we get a better efficiency. For the receiver, we operated close to the resonance or series resonance of this one because we get a lower impedance and we can do better impedance matching here. This shows the efficiency, PTE, we call it power transfer efficiency of the link versus different operation frequencies. So as we expected, because we designed this at 1.1 megahertz, at this frequency, we got the highest efficiency. And this is efficiency versus distance simulation measurement. So in measurement, we could get close to 0.2% at five centimeter. This means that if I transmit one watt of power, I can get close to two milliwatts at five centimeter depth using a one millimeter cube, which is very significant, significant because with two milliwatts, I can do a lot of different functions, recording or even stimulation. So then what we did, we developed an electronics for this. We developed an AC, an integrated circuit. This is the chip die photo that you can see here, one millimeter by half a millimeter almost. And this is the block diagram of the chip that we developed. So the chip had two main blocks, a power management, a data transmitter. The power management is shown here. Basically the transducer voltage comes here. This is like an active rectifier we made. We had a new technique. We use one transistor diode connector reverse bias, and we reuse the parasitic capacitance of the piezoelectric transducer to create a voltage doubler without adding any external capacitor. And this power management only requires one capacitor that does rectification, regulation, and also over voltage protection in case if the voltage is too high and we want to protect the chip. We also have this data communication part that is addressable in this example, we only had two addresses, zero and one, to show how we can make these seats addressable. So basically we put the address on the envelope of the signal and we detect the envelope and we check the ID. If the ID is correct, then that chip, that gastric seat sends the data back. Otherwise that stays silent and we can interrogate them one by one. This was developed in a 0.35 micron CMOS process at one megahertz uh, operation. This is the self-regulated power management, just to give you an idea how we did this. Basically, we use an, an amplifier that drives the gate of a PMOS. BGR is a constant voltage we had, and we compared this with the voltage that we want at the low. So this is our regulator voltage. We want it to be around three volts. If this was below three volts, then the amplifier output is low. This provides the largest current, and this comparator is very high speed. This creates a very high speed active rectifier with this switch, with this transistor and it charges the load with very high efficiency. So the voltage goes up, gets close to three. When it goes above three, we reduce the current, we make the comparator lower speed, so slow down the comparator. Then we allow some reverse current to go from the capacitor to the transducer, and we can regulate this voltage. So this is how we regulate it, and we get rectification and regulation. This is the benchtop measurement setup that um, we had in, in our system. So basically we had a water tank and uh, this is the power transmitter, which transducer, which is touching the water. We also use this as the data receiver. For the implant side, we have this transducer. These are two transducers. Basically they are stacked on top of each other. Maybe it's hard to see here, but there are actually two of them. Each of them has a diameter of one millimeter. Basically we put first the power receiver 
and then we put some silver epoxy on top of it. We put the data transmitter, and then we wire bonded this to their pad. So basically, one of them is used to receive power. One of them is used to transmit data. Um, and in this water time, we have a couple of centimeter distance, and this is connected to our chip here. This is the measurement results in benchtop setting with the setup that I just showed. This shows how the power management works. Basically, this is the voltage to the transmitter, to this transmitter um, piezoelectric transducer, that's Vs. Vp is the voltage received by that small transducer and Vl is the voltage that the chip creates. So as you can see, when we intentionally increase the transmitter voltage from 11 to from 11 to 18 volt peak to peak, VP a little bit increased, but VL was constant because the chip could provide a constant voltage. And here you can see zoomed waveforms for two condition. When we had 11 volt here, this is, a, this is working like a very high efficient, like high efficiency active rectifier. This is the case that when the voltage was too high and that transistor was turning on for long, longer time in order to do over voltage protection or reverse current, and we get this constant voltage. So the beauty of this one is that we are doing this simultaneous rectification, self-regulation and over voltage protection. So three functions by only one capacitor, which reduces the number of capacitors at the implant, which is supposed to be millimeter scale. This, this slide shows how we did the addressable communication. Basically uh, for communication, the way that we address two seats is through modulating the power carrier. This VP is the power carrier. If we create just one notch, this is address one. And when address one is high, ID zero, the, the, the seat with ID zero is enabled. These are hardwired IDs. When we create two notches and in between some signal, that's address zero, then ID one is enabled. So you can see for this address, only zero was enabled and sends the data. For this address, one was enabled and sends the data. And when they are enabled, the data that they send are 15 bits at the rate of 75 kilobits per second. And we always start with a supply check bit. Basically, this says whether the supply voltage is high or low. Then we can adjust the transmitted power. We have a 101 as start bits. We have 10 bit of data, which could be the analog to digital converter output, and then one n bit. And this is the received data that we have here. So in order to demonstrate this in vivo, we needed to complete the system. We needed amplifiers and also ADC. The first chip that we developed didn't have these two functions. That's why we combined the chip with some off-the-shelf component amplifiers that you can see here. They had a gain of 1,000 and a bandwidth of 18 millihertz to 500 millihertz. And then we use a microcontroller with a built-in analog to digital converter or ADC. And then this was could wirelessly also send the data out. So now we had a complete system for slow wave recording. And this slide shows the experimental setup for in vivo. This is in collaboration with uh, my collaborators at New York Institute of Technology. So what you can see here is that we had this water tank and we had the wireless link, six centimeter spacing between the transmitter and the receiver. The receiver was a one millimeter cube uh, transducer, very, very small. This was connected to the electronics here. We had the chip that we developed here with some of the off-the-shelf components. And then these electronics were connected to the rat. So we anesthetized the rat, opened the skin, and then there were two wires, one wire connected to the body of the, the, the rat for the ground, the reference, and another uh, one connected to the body of the stomach, sutured there for recording slow wave activity. And this is the in vivo results that we got. These are unfiltered, these are filtered, these are wired measurement, these are fully wireless measurement. First of all, we can see that there is a very good similarity between these two results. These two show that we could detect these slow wave activities with almost one millivolt peak amplitude. And also in this eight minutes of recording, we could have 12 events in both almost 11 here, 12 events of um, gastric slow waves, which relates to 1.5 cycles per minute of stomach beating in this example. So this is a preliminary in vivo experiment that we did and we hope to do more in future. So now 
Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about ultrasound power transfer with transducer array. So what I showed in the previous slides was powering a device, a single device with a single transducer. The challenge with that is that if the implant is, if the receiver moves, then you need to steer the beam towards the new location of the implant. Also, if you have multiple implants, as in our application, you need a beam former that can steer the beam toward different implants. So at the end of the day, in a realistic application, we need an array, a phase array here. And this is the work that we have started a couple of years ago. And here I'm showing you a linear array, it's like a 16 element in our work array that we have. This is a linear 1D array. In general, this could be two dimensional. We simplify to 1D to first demonstrate this, and then we will move to 2D in future. So in order to understand some of these um, annotations that I'm going to use, D is the capital letter, D is the aperture of this array. L is the length of one uh, transducer, one element. This D, lowercase d, is the inter-element spacing. Lowercase a is the width of each element, and curve is just the spacing between the elements. So the first thing that we did was that for power transfer, again, we need some optimization because you cannot just design them randomly and then operate them based on the application, which gives you what distance you want, how many implants you have, what loading you have in your receiver. We developed this optimization procedure that you can see here. And if you follow this step by step, at the end, you will come up with the, all the optimal geometries, the geometries that I just showed you here for the array and also for the receiver. And then based on this design procedure, we fabricated an array here, again, in-house. We started with the PCB, we developed, we designed a printed circuit board with this ground pad and excitation pad. We put we, from APC International, we purchased this bulk piezoelectric material, and then we cut them through a sewing machine, we diced them, and then we wire bonded them. And this is what you get as the array. And this is the receiver, the one millimeter cube receiver, which is very small here we have. We also built an experimental setup that I'm showing here. This is, this has a three axis stage that can move this transducer in three dimensions with micrometer resolution and everything is automated. This is the receiver transducer that I just showed you, the fabricated one. We had a driver, a 16 channel driver to drive this transmitter. And this is our ultrasound array that we developed in some of the measurements. We also put a chicken breast in between to mimic the tissue in this water tank. And we did experiments and measurements here. So this slide shows some of the measurements of beam focusing and steering. This is in water, this is in tissue. We, I'm showing here the simulated and measurement result. We got a very good matching between simulation and measurement. And this shows when we form the beam at zero degree. And this is the array, 16 element array that we have. So we focus the beam around 25 millimeter here. This shows the same measurement results in tissue when we use the chicken. Just note that the, here, this is the, this, the range is different. This is negative 20 to 20. This is negative 10 to 10. Uh, but if you look at them in the same range, the results were similar. What is interesting is that the maximum pressure is 0.8 megapascal here and around 0.8 megapascal here. The maximum pressure didn't change that much when we introduced the tissue here. We also demonstrated or checked the functionality of the array in beam steering and focusing. This is the, the measurement result when we steered the beam at 45 degrees. So this was zero degree, this is 45 degree. And here is beam steering at negative 45 degree. The pressure reduced a bit, but, but we could do this beam steering if the implant moves to a different location. So this is slide shows some of the measurements we did on power and efficiency. PL is the power that we could deliver to this one millimeter cube implant. So very small implant versus the optimal loading. And PT is the power transfer efficiency. These are power levels for different voltages across the transducer array from 10 volts all the way to 150 volts. When we applied pulses with as big as 150 volts, we could deliver more than even 10 milliwatts of power, again, to a one millimeter cube implant, which is really significant considering the small size of the implant. And the efficiency here, the maximum efficiency for the optimal loading of the receiver is around 0.14%. 
So if we call like around 0.1%, that means that one over thousands of power is delivered. If you deliver, if you transit one watt, you get one milliwatt power here. Also, what we did, we did a lot of experiments in which we changed the focal depth and also the steering angle of the array, and we measured the received power. So this is the power versus distance along this axial distance is here. So if this is the array, this is ortho, this is perpendicular to the array. This is the axial distance. This is like the implantation depth. So when we focus the beam at 10 millimeter to 30 millimeter, as you can see here, we are showing the power level. There are a couple of milliwatts here. When we have shorter distance, it was easier to get a high power, but at larger distance, when we focus, for example, at 30 millimeter, it was harder to get the peak power at 30 millimeter because our array was only 16 elements. If we make the array bigger in future, like with larger aperture and number of elements, we can get more power. And this green curve here is where we did similar measurement with tissue. And you can see that this is matching very well with the black one, which was the same condition without tissue, meaning that the tissue didn't change the result that much. This is the same type of measurements when we fix the focal depth, the implantation depth, like 20 millimeter, but we change the steering angle. We started from zero and we try to steer the beam at different angles from zero to 60 degrees. You can see that when we had zero degree, we could just achieve very high power and we could deliver high power to the implant to that one millimeter cube receiver. But when we increase the steering angle, especially this green, this, this brown one, which is theta s of 60 degrees here, the power level was smaller. So there are two reasons for this. One reason is that as we steer the beam to larger angle, the array provides less pressure at the, at the implant, at the receiver side, and that, and that causes lower power. This is one reason, but the main reason is the directivity of the receiver that we have. So the transducer that we fabricated here, this small transducer is like a disc shaped transducer. When the beam comes from an angle, it cannot detect all the pressure. And this is something that we need to work in future to improve this. And again, if anyone in this call is um, expert in improving this, in, in making a, tra a small transducer, a millimeter scale transducer with better directivity from different angles, I would love that and would love to collaborate and use that in our systems. But, but regardless of that, if you compare beam steering without beam steering, you see that still beam steering gives us a lot of power. So this blue one is when there is no beam steering, just the implant, the receiver is at zero degree, we get very high power. This red one is when we move the receiver for 13 millimeter to the right, and then we steer the beam at 45 degrees. We get this much power close to a milliwatt is less than what we got before because of what I just explained. But if we don't steer the beam, this green one is the same condition when we didn't steer the beam. You see that the power is much less. We are talking about maybe only 0.02 milliwatt, like 50 times to 100 times smaller power. This shows the significance of beam steering. But again, as I said, we need to do a better job in fabricating some transducers with better directivity. So this was the first part of the talk that I wanted to talk more about um, this ultrasound power transfer. Now we can talk a little bit about ultrasound stimulation and the work that we have done in this area. So there are different techniques to, for, for neuromodulation. Some of them are non-invasive, for example, transcranial magnetic stimulation or transcranial direct current stimulation. Uh, the problem with this non-invasive techniques is that they suffer from poor spatial resolution, a um, couple of centimeters in most of them. Or we have implantable techniques like electrical stimulation or optical stimulation. They can give us a very good uh, resolution. For example, optical stimulation or optogenetics can give us cell level specificity. But the problem is that they are very invasive. You need to implant probes or light sources or optical probes into the brain tissue, and this causes a lot of damage here. 
Recently, over the last decade, I would say transcranial focused ultrasound stimulation or TFUS has also become very popular and many groups have been trying to use ultrasound for stimulating the tissue. This is a conventional setup for ultrasound stimulation. What they do is that they use a very bulky transducer and then they have a power amplifier with signal generator, again, bulk electronics, and they drive this transducer in order to uh, couple some ultrasound, ultrasonic pressure to the tissue. And this pressure, ultrasound pressure given to the neural tissue can cause neurostimulation. So if we compare the current techniques, and here I'm showing three things which are very important. One of them is spatial resolution. We want to be as fine as possible. So we want to be here. One of them is spatial coverage. We want to have high spatial coverage, hopefully whole brain for large scale brain interfacing. And the other one is invasiveness. We want to be as low as possible here. So if I look here, the sweet spot is somewhere here. The non-invasive ones are suffering from poor spatial resolution. The invasive ones, implantable ones are suffering from high invasiveness and small spatial coverage. So the sweet spot is here and that's what motivated us to propose a new technique we call it microscopic ultrasound stimulation. So what do we do here? Basically what we are trying to do is to use an array of transducers which are ultrasonically, which are um, electronically driven in a beamforming fashion as I explained you for, for, for example, ultrasonic power transfer then we can steer the ultrasound beam towards any target we want. So with this, the first thing that we achieve is that we achieve large scale stimulation because now I can steer the beam. The second thing is that we want to implant this on the brain surface, either through thin skull or partially removed skull. So that gives us two advantages. One is that we can go to high frequency because now we are bypassing the skull and if you go to high frequency, you can get a very good spatial resolution in sub millimeter scale. And the second one is that because still we are on the tissue, we are on the brain surface, we are not implanting anything into the brain tissue. This is minimally invasive compared to the implantable system. This is much better in terms of invasiveness. So this is what we are planning to do. And the slides that I will show is to get us to here. So the first thing that we did was that we said, let's uh, simplify the array with a very small millimeter, millimeter scale transducer and study some of the important characteristics of this transducer so that we can learn in, in, optimi in optimizing this transducer. So if I have a transducer, again, I have a focal point. This focal point is where I have the highest intensity and I can get the stimulation in this focal point. So the parameters that we wanted to study were the dimension of the transducer, like the diameter, the thickness, the frequency, the backing layer, matching layer, and beam focusing. We wanted to see the effect of this on the transducer performance in the context of ultrasound stimulation. Conventional figure of medicine that are used usually for imaging, they are insertion loss or electrical to mechanical power, power efficiency, but these are not optimal for ultrasound stimulation. That's why we propose a new figure of merit that we call it I2PR. And this is maximum acoustic intensity that you achieve at the focal point divided by the input electrical power that you give to the transducer. So this is, inside this I2PR, we have the intensity, we also have the efficiency of the transducer. So we are considering both. So we use this I2, I2PR and then we fabricated nine different transducers in order to study them. Here I'm showing a couple of them. For example, some of them, they had PCB as the backing material. Some of them, they had air as the backing. Some of them were smaller device. For, for some of them, we had a flat PZT disc with a natural focus, but no focusing lens. For one of them, we developed, developed a focusing lens as you can see by creating this curvature. And we had an uh, encapsulation layer of Epotec and we created this lens. For one of them, even we did some acoustic matching by adding alumina on top of this one. So we have both the lens and alumina. So I'm not gonna go over the results of this and comparison of all of this. We have already discussed this in our t broadcast paper. But uh, I'm gonna show you a table that summarizes this result. Basically, we use this experimental setup 
we had the transducer, we used some sheep brain phantom to mimic the tissue and we had this hydrophone to measure the acoustic intensity. And this table summarizes all these transducers. We have nine of them and the parameters of all these transducers, for example, as you can see here, they have different diameters in millimeter scale, but different types of diameter, these different thicknesses. The encapsulation layer is different in them. The backing layer, we have air and PCB focusing. Many of them are not focused, but some of them are focused. And they are at different frequency from two megahertz to even nine megahertz at different um, focal depth. So what is important is this I2PR because we wanted to optimize this I2PR by optimizing the focusing lens and the, 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 the acoustic matching we could improve I2PR from 2.4 to 12.9, which is really significant. This means that my device now will need six times less power in order to create the same pressure, which is very important for portable or implantable applications. That's what we are envisioning in future. So this was just a single element transducer. Then we tried to extend this to an array because the microscopic stimulation concept that I showed, we need an array. And again, we started with a linear array because it's a simpler concept and we could demonstrate this. So what we did, we, op we proposed an optimization procedure, but to optimize the array for ultrasound remodulation, we needed a figure of merit. We developed here a new figure of merit, which, it is, which is pressure divided by square root of NAL times the cubic, uh, the cubic root of V. P is the pressure at the focal depth or at the focal zone. V is the volume of the focal spot, the half power beam width. NAL is actually the total piezoelectric area. We added this to the figure of merit because this will normalize the input power. So when we have this, we make sure that in this optimization, we are assuming constant input power in all the cases. And then this optimizes all these parameters and, and at the end gives you the optimal geometry that you need for transducer array for a given application. If you just input the depth that you need, the angle you need, this gives you the optimal values. And then again, we fabricated a transducer array with the same method that I explained in the previous slides. Um, we developed this 16 element array here for ultrasound neuromodulation. So, we have this element and array, we needed some electronics to drive them. We also developed ASICs or application specific integrated circuits. This is the first one that we developed. This was a one channel system, only had one output for a single element. And then we, we developed the multi-channel. So this has power management to create voltages. We have a high voltage 40 volt ASIC here. We have these gate drivers and this transistor that they drive this power amplifier. I'm not gonna go over the detail of the circuit and how we use this class D to improve the efficiency, but I'm gonna show you some of the results of the chip. This is the chip that we fabricated in a 0.25 micron high voltage CMOS process. The total area is 1.7 millimeter, millimeter square. And the highest voltage that we had here was 40 volts. So this chip can provide 40 volts of pulses. This is the top level measurement result. This is the output of the chip across the transducer. So we can create these pulses between zero and 40 volts. And the way that we can do is by level shifting this small signal. So we have, we create this optimal signals here. Then we shift this VGB up from zero to three to 36 to 40. By shifting this up, then we can drive a PMOS transistor and the output. This shows the measurement result of the ASIC. This is power and the first harmonic versus frequency. So we want the first harmonic to be as high as possible to have better linearity. And this shows that at 2.7 megahertz, that's the resonance frequency of the transducer. We got the highest harmonic, the most linearity, and we could deliver a couple of watts of power to this transducer. This shows the efficiency of our electronics again, versus frequency and the duty cycle of the driving. So this duty cycle is the duty cycle of these pulses that we apply because they're very important in order to achieve high efficiency. Uh, our models, they showed us that 
operating at 2.7 megahertz with 25% duty cycle should give us the best efficiency. And that's what you can see. We achieved the best efficiency of around 90%, 90% in, in this condition. If you change the duty cycle or frequency, the efficiency will drop. This shows the measurement result when we drove a, a, a transducer at 4.6 megahertz. Again, these are the vision and VGP signals that we created. We created them at low voltage. Then we had level shifters that shifted the levels up. This is the voltage across the transducer. We created these 40 volt pulses and this is the hydrophone voltage, which is around 1.2 volt peak to peak. This is around three megapascal of pressure, which is much higher than what is expected for ultrasound stimulation. For, for stimulation, we usually need a megapascal or, or even below that than that. And we can provide that by reducing even the lower voltage and lower power. So this was a single channel ASIC. This was good for driving a single transducer. We also recently developed a 16 channel electronics. As you can see here, this is the block diagram. We have 16 channels of these high voltage drivers, similar circuit that I just showed in the previous slides to drive 16 transducers for beam forming, beam steering. So what we envision in future is that we want to guide this beam for uh, proper or accurate anatomical targeting we need an imaging function for guiding. And that's why we put four channel imaging on this chip that we can use four elements for imaging the tissue and then guiding the stimulation. We also added an eight channel neural recording system for future closed loop neural interfacing. So if you have also some stimulation, you can have electrical recording, for example, EEG or ECOG, if you go further down in the, on, on, the, on the skin. So also we have power management and programmable delay lines so that we can program this. And we have inductive powering in future, we can provide inductive charging. This is the fabricated die, die um, of this chip. This is 8.7 millimeter by 6.6 .6 millimeter. These are different channels that we have one to five, six to 11 and 12 to 16. And these are the imaging channels we have and the other System again, these are the TSMC 0.25 micron high voltage VCD process. And we are using multiple supply voltages. This chip can operate as high as 45 volts. These are the preliminary measurement results that we did with this chip. Um, the one, one nice thing in this chip is that we have 16 channels and we can program them with only three pins, enable, clock, and data. Basically, what we need to do, we need to program the delay in each channel. For beam forming, we need to, we need to apply optimal delay to each channel. So here, this shows an, this shows an example of programming, programming 16 elements. And whenever we program it, this flag bit goes up, showing that the programming was successful. This shows the waveform that we generated with this chip across three different channels, like channel 13, 15, and 16 with different delay. This was like zero delay. We had 10 microsecond delay and 31.5 microsecond delay for this one. And this shows the delay that we measured versus the programmable delay line. PDL means program, programmable delay line code. So these are the codes that we program to the chip and we can get these different delays from zero to 30 microseconds. And these are the delays that we need for beam forming. And this is a zoomed version of the delay. So we are using a combination of coarse and fine delays to, to generate this delay here. So now we use this array and electronics and we did some measurements in the same setup that I showed to characterize these systems. So this is the driver. Here is the array with, this, with the hydrophone. This is the automated system that can move the hydrophone to get the profile of the beam. And in some of our measurements, even we added a skull from a rat, an experiment that we did a couple of, um, a couple of years ago, and we used this extra skull here. So these are the measurement results for focusing and steering. Again, I'm showing here simulation measurement result. Actually, in this one, we had a better matching between simulated and measured results. This is the axial distance. The array is here in these two. And these are the axial and lateral distance in the, in the Y, like um, 
this is aligned with the with the array here so this 16 element array was operating at 833.3 kilohertz these are the measurements for the 12 millimeter focusing so the depth of focusing is 12 millimeter it's like good for brain of a rat and zero angle and these are the resolutions that we achieve in different direction axial is here lateral and then lateral in z we could achieve like 1.6 millimeter in the lateral and nine millimeter in axial these are the and the pressure was 1.14 megapascal these are the measurements that we did with um, negative 45 degree steering angle and 45 degree steering angle so we wanted to show that we can focus the beam and steer the beam at different location. So this gives us the flexibility to focus the beam wherever we want into the brain region. Again, as we expected, a little bit the pressure reduced when we did the steering. We did similar measurements to what I showed for powering here. We also measured the axial and lateral resolution when we focused the beam at different distances. So here we focused the beam at distances from six to 18 millimeter. So when we focus at six millimeter, we got the maximum pressure at six millimeter. This is pressure versus axial distance. Again, axial distance is this distance from here, from the array going down and lateral is here. So when we increase the focal depth, we could move the peak pressure to different distances. At very large distances, harder to get higher peak pressure because the array has 16 elements, the aperture is limited and we need larger aperture for larger distances. This shows the pressure versus lateral distance that we achieve a couple of millimeter lateral resolution. We did the same measurements for pressure versus axial distance when we steered the beam at different angles from zero degree to 60 degree. And you can see that again, we could get high pressure at low angles. At higher angle, like 60 degrees, we got lower pressure. There is one reason here for this, which is actually there are two reasons again here. One is that the hydrophone that we use had a directivity of 80% at this angle. So we only could capture 80% of the pressure. The second is that when you have an, an array with small number of elements, it's harder to steer the beam at larger angles. So usually you need an array with more number of elements or with larger aperture. And this is again, the pressure versus lateral distance showing that we have steered this beam at different locations here. So we also did some preliminary experiments. This, is, this was done in collaboration with Patrick Drew uh, at ESM. And I'm gonna show you this. So basically what we did here, we anesthetized a mouse. We had the transducer located here. We, we uh, synchronize the stimulation with this LED light. When the LED light is on, we apply the pulses and then we could create this tail movement. And when we even created more, more stimulation like this light, we could create even more changes here and more tail movement. This shows the response of the rat to stimulation of the brain with ultrasound. So this is a summary of what I discussed here. Basically, I showed you how we can use circuits and ultrasound to develop novel technologies to interface with the body, with the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. For the stomach application, I showed you both the inductive and ultrasonic approaches and how they could, um, they could provide a slow wave recording. I also showed you the ultrasound stimulation concept with the transducers array and also the electronics that we developed. In general, what we are trying to develop here is high performance and minimal invasive neural interfaces. They can interface with the body for high resolution and large scale neural interfacing. So that's the goal that we have in these projects. And I would like to thank my former and current PhD students and postdocs who have been focused on this work and our collaborators and the funding agencies. Thank you and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Hard to do clapping on Zoom, but that was a very interesting presentation, a lot of really great work. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, say, please, uh, if you have questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask it. You can post it in the chat, um, however works best for you. 
uh, while you might be thinking of your questions, I'll go ahead and start with one. Um, so on your ultrasound neuromodulation circuit, you had your four imaging um, channels separate from your uh, transmit channels. And I was wondering if there was a reason you couldn't have the transmit channels also receive. Very good point. Actually, we can do that. Just this okay. is the, the drawing. So in our chip, we have 16 paths for driving, four paths for recording. We can use the same elements to receive. Uh, in this example, we just wanted to show that, I mean, the simplest is just to have 16 to transmit, four to receive. <laughs> Okay, great. I was thinking, it, I didn't know if there was a circuit reason that that was harder to do, so <laughs> excellent. Um, Scott, did you have a question? Yeah, I do, I do, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, great talk, uh, Mehdi. Um, maybe I, I missed this somewhere along the way. The depth in the brain, how, how deep um, can you achieve sort of reasonable powers of, of ultrasound in, into the brain tissue? Yeah, for this one, for this example, we targeted um, around 12 to 15 millimeter. For the raspberry, because we had a 16 um, element system and 16 element array, but because the at, especially at lower frequency, the, the, the attenuation is lower, we can go even higher depth. So if, if you need a couple of centimeters, that's not a problem. We need just what we need to develop is, or we need to do is to extend the number of elements and the number of channels in the electronics. And actually that's what we are trying to do. You are now my students are working on a 32 element array and a 32 channel system so that we can get more depth and better even better resolution and and sort of a quick follow-up on that then this might be showing my, my naiveness here with the transducers but you you basically you would apply that transducer and if you wanted to direct the signal to a particular site you would just change the beam angle you wouldn't physically adjust the angle of the transducer correct yeah the idea here is to have no mechanical movement basically you can, like if I go here, we have this driver, which is controlled by a computer. We just enter the, uh, the optimal delays for a specific location to this, and then this will change the focus to where you want without any mechanical movement. So we can go from here, for example, to here. This is like, this is zero, zero Y, this is Y of 10, like this is a totally different location. Right, 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 okay. Makes sense. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Since I'm seeing silence and nothing popping up in the chat, I'll go ahead and ask one other question. Is energy the only limitation to higher pressures? Um, is there anything in the circuits that would also have to change if you wanted to get to a nonlinear wave, for example? While nonlinear wave, what do you exactly mean? Like if we wanted to, take this sort of design and go towards therapeutics where we might want to have a nonlinear wave to cause heating or cavitation bio effects. I is yeah. energy the only limitation? Yeah, you know, this ASICs that we have, um, we are limited by the process that we use. Mm. So are limited to 45, Actually, this is 50 volt, but we don't go to more than 45 to be a bit safe. <laughs> so that limits the pressure that you can generate. And with okay. the system, we have a couple of megapascal. That's what we can go. We cannot generate 10 megapascal with this <laughs> or like 20 megapascal, but a couple of megapascal and lower is doable. Excellent. Uh, and Steve Hamburg said this was very fascinating stuff outside of his area of expertise, but he always learns new things. So great. Okay, last chance for questions. Yeah, but if you are interested in uh, any of these topics or things related to ultrasound with electronics, please feel free to let me know. We can chat and see how we can collaborate. So as, as I just I just tried to show you here that you have the capability to develop electronics and transducers and put them into a system. That's what we can do. And uh, we are looking for new applications. So if you have a new application, please let us know. Fantastic. A nice plug to get some more collaborations going. Excellent. Okay, well, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you all for coming and we'll see you next semester, hopefully. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for yep.